Hi, today we'll take a look at competition and predation. Now, organisms compete for limited resources, and there's two main types of competition. There is interspecific competition and intraspecific competition. So interspecific competition occurs between members of different species. Intraspecific competition occurs between members of the same species. So here on the bottom, you can see um, two lion males, and they are probably competing over control of a pride or control over a food source, this would be intraspecific competition because they are both members of the same species. Intraspecific competition is usually more intense because um, they're going after the same exact resources. On the right-hand side, you see what is known as interspecific competition, and this occurs between members of different species. So you see the uh, hyenas and the lions, um, they are in a brawl over some kind of resource that they are not looking to share. So this would be an example of intraspecific competition. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story here. When I first got married, we went on a honeymoon to the Caribbean, and we actually did some diving in Honduras and, and in Belize. And what we saw was an explosion of life um, in the ocean. We saw all of these different types of corals. We, see, we saw lots of species of fish. We saw cuttlefish, sea turtles. So we just saw this amazing, beautiful world um, high in biodiversity around us. And unfortunately, I lost the digital fire files of the photos I've taken. But here, I've taken pictures of actually printed photographs um, so that I could share them with you. So I've actually taken these photos. But what happened is later in our honeymoon, we actually went to some more developed islands in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, and what we saw there was drastically different. So this is what we saw. And I actually didn't take this picture here on the left because what I saw was so depressing, I didn't feel inspired to take a lot of photographs, but the one on the right is a picture that I have taken myself. So what we saw here was a lot of dead coral, and in its place was this green stuff. This algae had taken over. And while this is sad, it actually demonstrates a concept that we're going to look at next. And that concept is competitive exclusion. So two species, when they compete for the same limiting resource, um, one may drive the other one to local extinction, forcing it out. And what's happening in this particular example between the coral and the algae is that they're both competing for the same resource. They want to fill the same exact niche. They both want to live on the ocean floor. Um, they both want to live in the same area. And in this particular case, the algae wins. It grows more quickly, and it's able to actually suffocate the coral and drive it to local extinction. So this is known as competitive exclusion. When resources of competitors are not exactly the same, then they can actually continue to coexist without one forcing the other out. But each um, competitor's carrying capacity is going to be reduced. So fewer of each competitor can exist in that environment because they're splitting a resource. Other things that happen when organisms are in competition is something known as resource partitioning. And this is an evolutionary process, and it's how two competitors can become adapted to using a shared limiting resource. And, and basically, this is going to minimize competition between them. So similar species will use part of an available resource. And the famous example of this involves these warblers, which are these small birds. And on their own, these birds would be super happy living on any part of the tree, making their nest there, feeding on whatever um, organisms are available there. So each of these warblers would be perfectly happy in the whole tree. However, they need to minimize competition because there are so many of them. And what they do here is resource partition. So they divide up the tree into different areas, which are indicated with a shaded color, and they all live in a different part of the tree. And this allows them to coexist with each other and places them out of direct competition. So this is known as resource partitioning. Now, character displacement occurs um, when two species become less similar in their resource requirements, where the organisms actually change. So they can develop anatomical differences through um, evolution, and they can also uh, evolve to have different niches. So the example here is... 
um, on the island of Puerto Rico involving these lizard species. And these lizard species evolved to become anatomically different from each other to minimize competition between them. So each of these lizard species lives in a, a separate location, separate habitat. It has a different niche from the other, and they're not in direct competition, and they can all live um, on the island together without forcing each other out. So you can see here is one species living off of it looks like cacti, some shrub living species of lizards, some of them living up in the trees, the arboreal ver uh, varieties, and this is known as character displacement. Okay. Uh, predation involves one species capturing and killing and digesting the other species. So here is a classic predator-prey interaction, right? You have a lynx and you have a hare, predator and prey. The abundance, so how many of the prey species we have, is going to limit how many predators that environment can support. In fact, predator and prey populations uh, sometimes follow each other in a cyclical fashion with predator abundance lagging behind the prey abundance. So here is one example involving the lynx and the snowshoe hare, and you can see there are two populations um, on this graph here. And the blue is, of course, the prey, so the um, snowshoe hare population, and the red here is the lynx population. You can see them responding to each other, and you can see the cyclical nature of the predator-prey populations, right? So if prey populations are high, the predator populations can grow. As the predators eat more of the prey, the prey population will come down, and then so will the predator population. In this sense, it's, it's a very cyclical cycle. Okay, predator-prey arms race. So predator and prey um, co-evolve with each other, and co-evolution is a back-and-forth adjustment between two species that interact with each other. So this example, the, on this photo, um, there are these newts, and this is a newt right over here. And these newts have highly poisonous substances in them known as tetrodotoxin. Even a small amount of this toxin can actually kill a potential predator. So how can the snake eat the newt? And it's because this snake has evolved um, ways to neutralize that toxin, allowing them to get nutrition out of the newt without becoming sick or dying. So this is an example of co-evolution. As the newt became more toxic, the snake that ate the newt evolved to be able to neutralize that toxin. So... Prey species aren't just passive, they have defenses that allow them some protection from their predators. So some prey items have like spikes like this or thorns, or you see the hedgehog can roll into a ball and it's very difficult for a predator to eat. Uh, predators, on the other hand, will evolve ways to eat their prey. So here you can see a crab. Um, which has claws that can pierce and and uh, the sea urchins so that they can use them for energy. Um, predators can also evolve to become faster in response to speedy prey. So they are co-evolving and adjusting themselves uh, in response to the prey. So predator and prey co-evolve with each other. Okay, other things that predators and other things that actually preys have, other qualities, or evolutionary adaptations that prey have include mimicry. Mimicry is a pattern in which one species resembles another one, often one that is more dangerous. And camouflage is a body form or coloration pattern that allows an animal to blend into its surroundings and avoid detection. So you can see over here um, on this picture, it's more than just leaves. What you see here is actually um, an organism hiding right here. This is a version of camouflage. And next we're gonna take a look at mimicry. And I'm going to show you an awesome video. This is the Mimic Octopus. And the Mimic Octopus is actually really good at camouflage. You just saw camouflage. It can bend, blend in with its surroundings. But it is called the Mimic Octopus for a reason. And later in this video, you're going to see the Mimic Octopus trying to act like it's another organism. Okay, so watch for it. Watch for it any second now. Okay, so here, this one's a funny interaction because you see the crab has gone to attack the mimic octopus. And the mimic octopus has transformed. And look at the crab there. It's like, oh, uh, just kidding. I'm going to go. Have a nice day. And here you can see the um, octopus starting to take different forms. This here, it's acting like the poisonous flatfish. Here, it looks like the deadly sea snake. 
Um, here it's masquerading as a lionfish, which can sting. So predators will avoid it, thinking that the mimic octopus, which is a yummy meal, is in fact one of those very dangerous animals. Okay, plant herbivore arms race. Herbivory is when an animal feeds on plants or plant parts. And herbivores um, also have to deal with defenses of the plants because plants can defend themselves as well. Some plants, for example, can recover very quickly. So prairie grasses, for example, have enough resources in their roots so if they're eaten by large herbivores like buffalo, they can grow back and they, aren't, um, they don't become locally extinct. Other herbivores have defenses like spines or thorns. You can see some thorns over here. Or they have foul-tasting chemicals or toxic chemicals inside of them. In fact, caffeine evolved as a defense um, against insects. Caffeine actually paralyzes and kills many insects that try to feed on them. It's a natural pesticide. We, of course, um, think of caffeine differently. It's in our coffee, and it's not so dangerous to us, but it originally evolved as part of this plant herbivore arms race. So here is an example of co-evolution between herbivores and plants. They also evolve in response to each other. So what you can see here is the koala eating a eucalyptus, and the eucalyptus actually has some toxic chemicals in it, but the koala has, been, has evolved to be able to tolerate that and get nutrition out of the eucalyptus. On the right-hand side, you see the Morgan sphinx moth, and it, this long thing here is actually its tongue. And the reason it has such a long tongue is because it is trying to get to the pollen at the bottom of this really, really long tube inside of what is known as Darwin's orchid. So as the orchid evolved to have a deeper shape, the moth evolved to have a longer and longer tongue so it can access the pollen. So they have co-evolved herbivore, and plant co-evolved with each other over time. So I hope this was a helpful introduction to predators, to herbivores, and to competition. Thank you for watching.